Welcome to In Focus Texas, where we take an in-depth look at the issues that matter to you. I'm your host, Carla Leal. As Texas continues to grow, the state is adapting to maintain its infrastructure. These systems address air, land, and sea needs and are built to help Texans and our economy thrive. For more than two decades, Texas has been named the top exporter in our state continues to invest for the future. This includes a 10-year, $83 billion commitment to new state roadway projects. Ongoing expansion can come with its own set of challenges. San Antonio's downtown and surrounding areas are getting a makeover, but some business owners aren't happy about it. Our Jose Arredondo spoke to a business owner who says construction near his restaurant is taking a toll on his profits. Growing up in San Antonio, Augustine was always surrounded by small businesses in the barrio. Oh, absolutely, yeah. Like, I dreamed of being a business owner when I was a kid back in those days. He made that dream a reality in the late 90s when he opened up Augie's Barbecue. It's the essence of everything that we do here. Our, our, we use one spice for everything. Okay. Everything. We don't have a big spice rack or all that. Augie takes pride in making everything fresh. Like when you go over to your Theo's house on a Sunday to watch the Cowboys play. But Augie doesn't feel too confident about his second location surviving the large construction project that neighbors Whatever in. that the city's doing to, to help make things better, it usually hurts a lot of people while they're doing it. He says it's hindered about 80% of his business. You see, this restaurant sits on Broadway, a long road that pierces through the heart of downtown San Antonio. And as the city's juggling multiple construction projects all over San Antonio, there are dozens of small businesses that are struggling in that process. And, and the city needs to make a change because it's been the same problem for too many years now. So the city suggested a $400,000 solution, a mitigation pilot program where 310000 will be used for marketing, and promotion for the businesses affected by the construction project citywide. We need more signs to let people know that we're open. How does that make any sense at all? Someone please explain that to me. Augie posed that question to the city because he said signage isn't the issue. It's the lack of access to his restaurant. He says there's literally only one route to take to his restaurant now that Broadway is shut down and that an important street has now become a one-way. Look, are they trying? Yeah. They're trying to figure out a way to make this work. Let's be fair, right? Many city officials do feel like they've let down the small businesses and even suggested to have new agenda items for next year about possible larger grants rather than loans, which could put businesses into more debt. We need money from you. We need you to work together with us as a team so we can work together to help make this work for you and for the small businesses. That was our Jose Arredondo reporting. A nonpartisan think tank has been looking at ways to make our state the best place to live and work for the next generation of Texans. And it's named Texas 2036. John Harchak is the nonprofit senior vice president of policy and advocacy. And he joins me in our studios today. John, welcome to In Focus Texas. Thank you for having me. Well, Texas 2036 dives into an array of issues that impact our state, including our state's population boom. Help us better understand how has Texas changed in the last decade and what role do those new Texans setting roots here play in our state's evolution? Well, just in the last year, our state passed the 30 million mark, which is a big threshold. And as we look forward to our bicentennial in 2036, we're expecting another 8 million Texans to get here. That's a lot of growth that's been happening very quickly. And a lot of these folks are coming from other states, a large amount of domestic migration. Um, and they're bringing their college degrees and their families, but they're not bringing roads or water or broadband. So there are growth challenges that we experienced in, to fully benefit from, from that population growth. Talk to us more about uh, what our Texans needs right now. How are they changing because of this growth? You know, we have uh, a booming economy. Uh, we're in a blessed position relative to other states, both in terms of job growth, 
uh, and just generally, you know, cost of living. But we are experiencing cost of living challenges. We're experiencing disconnects between the skills of our workforce and the demands of our employers. Uh, we're experiencing challenges with regard to not having enough water supply and aging infrastructure that, uh, to meet our future population demands. Um, we have a park system that's bursting at the seams from being loved uh, overwhelmingly as it, it's on its 100th anniversary this year and it's popular but Texas is growing. So we have, we have good problems relative to other states but there, we also have a, a budget surplus that gives us a historic opportunity to address those things before they become problematic. How are you yeah. pushing uh, for different types of legislation decision? Well, first and foremost, we look to the data. We're driven by what does the data say? We believe it can cut across ideological lines and, and form a, um, a cohesive understanding of where, where we need to prioritize things. And our data shows some real challenges out there with regards to our workforce, with regards to our water, with regards to a lot of the other um, infrastructure issues that are facing our state with that, that large growth. Um, and so then we try to use the data to find solutions. So we're very heartened to see that the legislature is working really hard on community college finance reform this session. It's funded in the, the early budgets. It seems to have a lot of support. Those are big, comprehensive, data-driven solutions that look at here's a disconnect between our population's educational attainment and the skills needed in our future workforce. How can we invest in data-proven um, strategies to kind of connect the dots there? And that's just one of many things that the legislature is looking at this session that can help connect um, our current challenges to future opportunities. So working hand in hand with them. And your organization also conducts surveys like the Texas Voter Poll to see what Texans envision in our state. What are some of the key findings of your most, most recent survey? Yeah, we have a historic surplus. Uh, $32.7 billion in carryover funds from the last biennium, plus more revenue growth and a large rainy day fund. We are in a blessed position relative to other states. Uh, and voters want to see action. They want to see that money spent on generationally impactful investments. Things like fixing our aging water uh, infrastructure, addressing cybersecurity needs for our state, um, looking at our state park system, going in and fixing flood infrastructure. There are all these things that are out there that are kind of big and impactful and directly impact people's lives. And when we poll, it's not just a majority of Texans supporting it. It's 70, 80, almost 90% of Texans out there wanting to get some of these big generationally impactful investments across the finish line. I do want to ask you about our state's bicentennial because it's just 13 years away yeah. and your organization's name highlights the year that it takes place. So what goals are you working to accomplish between now and our state's 200 year anniversary? As proud as we are of being Texans, we know that there's, we can always be better, right? And so we know we can do more to get our uh, students the skills they need to succeed and get good paying jobs. We know we can make health care more affordable. We know we can have the best energy markets and growth in the, the state of, uh, in the nation. We know that our water can be the envy of all Western states. We know that we can have a government that uses your tax dollars efficiently and provides excellent customer service. And we know that we can have a justice and safety system uh, that makes people proud and trust their law enforcement and have those safe communities that we all strive for. Well, John, thank you. Up next, we'll show you how one Texas city is working to create safe spaces for cyclists. Thanks for keeping it here. The city of Dallas is working to update its bike mobility plan. The goal is to improve accessibility for cyclists. Our Robin Richardson tells us why these efforts are quite important. I've been hit. By a car? Mm -hmm. By a couple of cars, yeah. Tenured cyclist Bob Schmallholz knows a thing or two about the importance of bicycle safety. And I ended up on the hood of the car. It's interactions like these that make him passionate about having safe spaces for cyclists. Cyclists as, on a, as a whole love bike lanes because again, it gets me away from a motor vehicle. They're 5,000 pounds and, and at best I'm gonna be 300 pounds with my bike. 
I'm going to lose the fight every time. Dallas City staff recognize the need as well. They're drafting a plan that would develop bicycle boulevards, traffic diverters, and even a bike lane that increases safe travel among riders. Jessica Scott with the City of Dallas says they hope to finalize the plan by this summer. Having transportation options um, is important for equity and safety and access to, to our daily needs and providing an alternative form of transportation, um, such as uh, bike lanes so that people feel safer and more comfortable to choose to bike um, and to, um, to provide that um, to people who are already having to bike um, is really important to the city. Having been in bicycle accidents, Bob says it's a welcome intervention by the city. There's, there's just so many of us out here, whether we're a recreational cyclist out wanting to ride with our family, um, a commuter cyclist trying to get to and from work, or a fitness person, a, a person out there riding their bike for fitness. There's just an awful lot of bikes out there. Um, and, and anything we can do to make it safer for a bicyclist on the road is just a, a good thing for Dallas. That was our Robin Richardson reporting. Just like transportation and electricity, water is vital, and it's a vital part of our state's infrastructure. Several out-of-state and local organizations follow water infrastructure closely, including the nonprofit Texas 2036, we featured earlier in our show, and Jeremy Maser is also part of this group. You are their senior policy advisor. Welcome to In Focus Texas. Wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for inviting us to talk about water, which is so important for our state. Definitely. Texas 2036 recently released a legislative blueprint to address water infrastructure in Texas. What type of problems is Texas seeing due to our state's aging water systems? Well, we have a, we have a very big problem with our aging, deteriorating water and wastewater systems. When we look at the data, you know, even though we have a state water plan, our drinking water infrastructure gets a C minus from the engineers. Our wastewater, which discharges into our rivers, lakes, and reservoirs, that gets a near failing grade of a D. And then on top of that, our systems are so old, so fragile, and they leak so much water. Enough water leaks out of the 10,000 plus public water systems to fill a major storage reservoir like Lake Buchanan or Possum Kingdom Lake every single year. How should these problems be addressed and what could happen if the investment in water infrastructure in our state is not there or there's not enough? Well, we need to recognize that good, robust, resilient water and wastewater infrastructure is essential for community development and economic vitality across the state. It's important for urban areas like Texas, but also the rural parts of our, our state. If we're gonna make these state investments in broadband, education, and healthcare, we need to make sure that there's a strong, robust water system and wastewater systems serving these communities so that all Texans can prosper. This session, we have proposed in our Texas 2036 blueprint for the legislative. I was about to ask you about that. Sorry. What is it that you are proposing to our legislators to address the water crisis and, and how much would it cost though? Well, we're proposing a, a Texas two-step. The first is about funding. We think it's important that the legislature create a new fund that's dedicated to the issue of fixing our aging, deteriorating water systems. On top of creating that fund, we think that this investment is so needed for such a long time, we're recommending that the legislature deposit $5 billion into this fund and explore ways of establishing other revenue streams to this fund so there'll be more money to go into it as our projects uh, become needed over time. But the other part that we wanna talk about are the policy interventions, like how can we have a strong, meaningful state policy to fix this growing, critical problem of aging, deteriorating water systems. And in our blueprint, we have several recommendations towards that objective. First, we think that we need to focus on the data and have a data-driven approach to identify utilities that are actually failing or at risk of failing. And so we're recommending that we draw on a model being used in other Western states that, that looks at the data what type of water they're using, do they have enough water, how old is their system, are people relying on bottled water or hauled water as their, as their water source, and use these criteria to identify utilities that are failing 
or at risk of failing, so that we can use that to triage how we disperse the funds of this new fund. The second thing we're talking about is expanding our state's technical assistance outreach. And think of these as special helpers, as you were, engineers, folks that have experience working with communities to identify what the problems are with their systems. Because it takes a village, right? It does take a village, and we need a bigger village to fix the problem of our aging, deteriorating infrastructure. What are Texas voters uh, thinking about our water system? Uh, are they aware of the water system failures? Do they support uh, you know, investing in this area? Absolutely they do. Texans are incredibly worried about water in Texas. Just this week, we released a new poll, our sixth Texas voter poll. And we asked Texans, you know, what do you think the, vote, the, the legislature should be spending some of this budget surplus on? Should it be on parks, cybersecurity, flood control and mitigation? We also included the question, like, you know, should the legislature spend $5 billion on fixing our aging, deteriorating water and wastewater infrastructure? To our surprise, 89%, nearly nine out of 10 Texans, supported the prospect, the proposition, of the legislature creating a new fund and putting $5 billion in it to fix the problem of aging infrastructure. Texans see this as a problem and they want the legislature to fix it. Jeremy, thank you for your perspective. Thank you so much for your time. Next, how the state's infrastructure is impacting the demand for more line workers. Stay with us. We're back. When extreme weather conditions impact our state, they shed light on the important role essential workers like line workers play to keep our state going. Our JJ Maldonado shows us what some community colleges are doing to prepare more Texans for these jobs. I graduated in October of 2020. Israel Sarita is a recent graduate at Austin Community College's line worker program. The program, it gives you a pretty good insight of what's going to be going on in the field uh, in your everyday, um, in your everyday routine. Israel now works as a professional line worker in Central Texas. Our, our job, it doesn't, it doesn't stop when the sun goes down. Most recently, the winter ice storm highlighted just how tough the job is. Working during the ice storm is, um, is definitely challenging, um, especially with all the weather, the ice, the slippery roads. Experts in the industry say as populations and infrastructures grow in cities across Texas, so will the need for more line workers. These guys are really behind the scenes. And the reason that you can go home every night and you hit that switch on the wall and the lights come on, these are the guys here that actually maintain the system. Ray Cook is an instructor of ACC's line worker program. The program at ACC is offered at a discounted cost due to the need of more line workers in the field. Cook says the industry is also seeing a trend of workers who are older professionals. According to Lyman Central, an industry resource, more linemen are retiring than there are new linemen entering the trade. So who's going to take their place? So that's the big demand. Trade schools across our state, like the Austin Career Institute, are also training Texans to excel in high-demand jobs. I spoke to their CEO, Sean Jamal Lee, about their innovative approach to education. Sean Jamal Lee, welcome to In Focus, Texas. We just saw an example of how the latest winter storm that impacted several parts of Texas highlighted the need for line workers. In what industries here in Texas is the Austin Career Institute seeing labor shortages or other work challenges, and how are you helping address their needs? Uh, what we're seeing is a huge shortage, shortage in uh, technicians in general of any sort. Uh, people who uh, know how to do hands-on work, but it's more technically oriented. For example, HVAC technicians, electricians, plumbers, line workers, uh, any areas that require that sort of in-depth knowledge of the technical uh, industries that are out there that uh, need folks to just come in and uh, fix things. 
What type of Texans would benefit from getting uh, vocational training or the certifications schools like yours offer? Uh, I believe uh, anybody would because uh, the, the pay is very good uh, and uh, the, the work is out there. There's a shortage actually in these industries. Um, we have a huge focus on trying to get uh, more um, uh, females, for example, involved in this in these type of industries. It takes about uh, eight months uh, to nine months um, to to uh, finish uh, one of these programs. How do you help the alumni find jobs in those fields of their choice? Um, we have uh, job placement assistance, uh, which where uh, we uh, find uh, jobs for our students. Uh, we have a student services department where we bring in um, employers to meet with the students. We have job fairs. Uh, uh, but what we have noticed is that most of the times we have more employers looking for technicians than we have the students. Because again, there's a shortage of uh, technicians right now in Texas as, as a whole and also United States as a whole. I know you have a medical program, electricity, and HVAC, correct? Right, electrician and, uh, and HVAC, yes, and, and call assistant. Okay, so how are you preparing your students to survive in those fields like electricity and tech and medicine where technology is constantly evolving? Well, we give them the basic knowledge of uh, what it takes uh, to become a good tech. Uh, we always say we want to produce uh, great technicians who can actually fix things. Uh, so we they get uh, really, really great knowledge on the basic level. The foundation is what we pour and they can build on it as they go into these different industries and gain more experience down the road. Uh, the biggest thing about HVAC being an electrician, being a medical assistant, the biggest thing I think is that these are jobs that cannot be exported overseas. They will not, there will not be a robot that's gonna be able to fix your home AC or become an electrician. So these are pretty um, stable jobs that are going to be around for many, many years to come. All right. Well, Sean Jamali, thank you for connecting with us. Thank you for having me. That'll do it for this week's In Focus Texas. I'm Carla Leal. Thanks for joining us to explore our state's infrastructure. Take care, and we'll see you next time.